Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Um, in continuing the grand tradition of counter-programming to what all the pundits are talking about, uh, we are going to go do a deep dive on education today and um, have two of my colleagues from AI who have uh, a new book out, Getting Education Right, A Conservative Vision for Improving Early Childhood, K-12, through and college by rick hess who is the uh i think i the way i explained this last time in if aei were a supermax prison he would be ahead of one of the most feared prison gangs um which is the education shop and everyone just gives it a really wide berth i don't completely understand but you just you just you got to be careful just like like if he comes over and wants to eat the apple brown Betty off your tray in the cafeteria, you let him. Okay. Um, so he runs the education shop. I don't know what his actual title is. And then Mike McShane, McShane is an adjunct fellow at AI on education for education stuff. And he's the director of national research at Ed Choice. Guys, welcome to the remnant. Hey, thanks for having us, man. Thanks so much for having us. Okay. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of a traffic cop. I was, I was saying to you guys before, fortunately, you guys don't. Um, sound too much alike so i don't have to do ed rick the standard question for authors on this podcast for the first question is what's your book about so what's your book about yeah sure i'll tackle it look i think luckily i'll take the easy question to start with when you get the the tough ones you can throw them rick's way because yes i don't i think if he's the school the schoolyard bully or the prison bully i don't know if i'm the guy off to the side that you talk to ahead of time kind of like was that paulie and goodfellas you know he'd only talk to a couple people i guess that's me but anyway so yeah so our book pretty much does what it says on the tin in the sense that in the opening chapter, it spells out sort of how we imagine what it means to be a conservative in education in the year of our Lord 2024, um, which frequent uh, listeners of The Remnant will realize that that is a contested space. <laughs> different people envision today what it means to be conservative in different ways. We try to spell out the way we envision that, not saying that it's what everyone thinks, but what we do. And then we sort of close the chapter by laying out these eight principles that we think should guide conservative education policymaking. And we think that they're roughly universal in the sense that they apply if kids are three or if they're 23. Um, uh, so we spell out those policies. And then basically the guts of the book walk chronologically through a child's life. We start with a chapter on family policy. Then we go to early childhood education and then K-12 and then higher education. And we basically just try to apply those policies to those various issue areas. And so ultimately, this is a book about the types of institutions that we'd like to see, the types of people that we would like to populate those institutions, to teach in those institutions, to work in those institutions, and the ends that we want those institutions to pursue. Rick, why don't we do this the, in reverse order then? Rather than talking about what the remedies are um, that Mike just laid out, let's start with what are the problems? Like, what are the areas that your you guys think of the existing system need to be corrected most and and why sure so there's um there's kind of a why us problem and there's kind of a wonky what's wrong problem uh the why us problem is that you know i came to aei back in 2002 no child left behind had just been passed and for the better part of two plus decades um my frustration has been that i know what the right is against on education but I generally don't know what we're for other than school choice. And school choice is great. Mike and I are <laughs> Mike's research director for Ed Choice. Um, but when you're talking about unreliable early childhood ed, when you're talking about folks not wanting to have to go to college, when you're talking about overpriced uh, sec uh, you know, college institutions, school choice doesn't answer any of this stuff. So part of the problem here that we try to tackle in the book is what should we be for and how do you propose that in a principled way? Re, you know, we used to try to do this in education in a bipartisan fashion 10 or 15 years ago, but not only has the left gone down rabbit holes that make that very difficult today, but because of their institutional alliances with teacher unions, with the faculty lounge, with the early childhood lobby, all the left can really do when it comes to improving education is talk about strategies for subsidizing or supersizing. So student loan forgiveness, or more money for early childhood, or more money for teachers. So problem is, those aren't actually the challenges for American education. What are the challenges? In early childhood, the biggest challenge is that families need reliable, 
quality options and they don't have them. In K-12, the problem is we want schools that forge uh, the democratic character, that make sure kids are mastering crucial knowledge and skills, and we're doing a lousy job on both counts. And in higher ed, we want institutions that are formative, uh, that take seriously the need to make sure their students are getting uh, skills and training that provide them for options ahead, that take seriously the mantle of research and intellectual inquiry, and they're falling short. So none of this is about money. It's almost all about values and formation and how we think and approach education. And so that's what the book's about. All right, so let's s- start with the early education part of it. What does a conservative agenda or what does the, the Hess McShane agenda look like for early education? So, you know, one of the things, again, Mike mentioned that we, you know, we're not trying to write the conservative book. We're writing a book about where we're coming from. And it starts, you know, for us, uh, a lot of this starts with pretty obvious insights from folks like Kirk. Um, Conservatives believe in the importance of family. When you look at most of what we've been trying to do on early childhood for the last decade or three, um, it's figuring out ways to move three and four-year-olds into big institutional settings. So the Bill de Blasio model in New York City. Let's take uh, overpriced, ineffectual, union-run schools. Uh, Let's add two grades of pre-K. Let's ask families to stick four-year-olds in buildings with 10 and 12-year-olds on a school calendar that works for the unions and then ship those kids home at two o'clock, whether or not that actually fits a parent schedule. What's an alternative? An alternative is to say what families actually want is early childhood that's proximate to where they work. So that if kids are sick, they can go check in on them so they don't actually have to add a third point of contact when they're dropping kids in the morning or getting them in the afternoon. They want schedules that reflect their work calendar rather than the school calendar. They want settings that tend to be intimate and familial. Uh, They like friends and family care. And because we're not worried about marching through scope and sequence of instruction, you've got a lot of flexibility. This suggests what we ought to be doing is encouraging employers to do this uh, through the tax code. We ought to be offering it as an employee benefit. Uh, We ought to make sure that it's easier for folks to open and provide these cares and less likely that they'll be strangled by red tape. In fact, Glenn Youngkin just rolled out about three or four months ago um, a pretty decent version of what a conservative approach to early childhood looks like. That's the kind of thing we have in mind. On, on the thing about being pro-family, so I, the thing I struggle with on all these things is the people who care about family complain a lot about schools. The people who care about schools complain a lot about the families, and so on and so on in this ever-expanding circle of, you know, causality and finger-pointing. And, and it's sort of like trying to fix a car where, you know, one component of the car is faulty, so that affects the other parts of the car, which then start to break down. And you're trying to fix it while you're still driving, and um, and so like all it, it the the causal arrows are just a hot mess, right? So like if if you could fix the family perfectly, a lot of the problems in schools would not exist to the extent that they have. But if you could fix the problems in schools, you the problems with the families wouldn't be as bad, right? I mean, it's like there is the 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 arrows point in both directions. How much, I mean, so let me ask it this way. You know, I just had um, our, our, our colleague, Brad Wilcox, who's, you know, talking about marriage and all these kinds of things. It seems to me that a lot of the problems you have in schools have to do with the fact that, that you have a lot of parents who are not acting like they're stakeholders in their kids' schools. Um, and they're not doing the things, raising their kids, that make the jobs of teachers easier to take over their kids for a little bit. How much of how many of the reforms do you think that you guys are pushing here can really work without the engagement of families? So this is fantastic because literally and not in the way Joe Biden uses literally, but literally (laughs) the first of the eight principles that we outline is the idea that education is a handshake. And I think part of this comes from Rick and I were both teachers and we're both parents. So we've been on both sides of of this issue and seen it quite clearly. But 
sort of exactly to what you were saying. Education fundamentally is a handshake. If we think about it sort of in the narrow sense between the student and the teacher, and if we think of in a broader sense between the school and the family, and you're right, it really is very, very difficult if both sides of that handshake are not, you know, firmly grasping one another. And frankly, you know, we, we were a little bit critical of some of the efforts recently in education reform, where it was big on, you know, test-based teacher evaluation, or even a lot of the kind of No Child Left Behind era school accountability, where we're really trying to hold one end of that handshake accountable without having anything to say about that other piece. And then we're kind of shocked when teachers and school administrators aren't really on board with any of the stuff that, that we're talking about. And it's like, well, you know, we need them to be professionals. We need them to be well-prepared. We need them to use the best practices and follow things like the science of reading and other things that we've been learning recently, the best pedagogical tools as far as we understand them now. But you're right. So, I mean, part of this is, I mean, I, in some ways, it's a deeply sort of conservative insight that we're in a fallen world and we have to find ways to muddle through. So a lot of what we're talking about here has to be based in that in that fundamental recognition that we need to start by saying both of these groups need to work together. We need to do what we can to try and make it easier for families to to hold up their end of the bargain. Absolutely. And, and we spell out those things. But you're right. I mean, if you are teaching a classroom, Rick and I were both high school teachers and a student shows up and they don't want to be there, and they don't want to learn. And when you call home to their parent, and their parent says, this is your problem, not my problem, there are, lim there are limited tools in the toolbox to do something about that. And ultimately, we need to think about, you know, how our institutions deal with that and how the folks that are in them do. But I mean, I think it's, it, it is a fundamental chicken and egg problem that we can try and make both sides better, but recognize that there are these disjunctures that can exist. There's, you know, I mean, there's, and there, there, I mean that's well said. And there's also a uh, historic dimension to this. Back when, you know, I started teaching high school back in the last century and then taught student teachers, it was the easiest thing in the world to find a teacher who would say, I can't teach that kid. Can't teach that kid. They don't want to be here. And it had to do with what part of town they were from. It had to do with skin color. It had to do with the usual stuff. One of the great triumphs of the last quarter century, and it was a bipartisan triumph, was that we changed the notion of what educators should be expected to do that they were responsible for trying to educate every kid in their charge. You'll still get teachers who quietly mumble, I can't teach that kid, but they'll now say it like in the corner of the parking lot. They won't say it like out, out loud in school. I mean, that was a really good and healthy thing. The problem was in saying that you can't blame the parents, we actually created a new problem that we didn't anticipate. In the 1990s, it used to be really easy to find conservative leaders who would wave their finger at parents and say, you've got to do your part. You've got to make sure your kid gets to school on time. You've got to make sure they do their homework. Today, you have to break your back to try to find anybody, a superintendent, a principal, a governor, who will say to parents, you know what? You've got to take away your kid's cell phone at 8 o'clock at night. You've got to make sure your kid shows up in the morning. You've got to get the teachers back. We've taken that out of the vernacular, and as a result, Teachers feel scapegoated. They feel like they're the only ones who we want to talk about accountability for. So while it's odd at a point in time when most conservative rhetoric around education is around parent rights, what Mike and I said talk about in this book very explicitly is we absolutely think parents have a right to see the curricula being used. They have a right to be heard. They have a right to worry about pornographic texts in middle school libraries. But they also have responsibilities, and way too few folks on the right are interested or willing to talk about those responsibilities today. So one of the things, I know this is an issue, particularly in elite universities, but we'll, and we'll get to those in a second, but one of the things you hear a lot about rising education costs in the or rising education spending, um, which is a subtle distinction, um, is that um, a lot of money is going to a sort of an explosion in administrators and bureaucrats. That's my impression from my recollection about about K through 12, I know it's, I, I've read, I have, I have better recall because I was, I read that stuff sober about, uh, about the university stuff. It always seemed to me like a really good sort of Jeb Bushian and, you know, all praise and honor, um, kind of campaign promise would be to say, Hey, look, what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the size of the bureaucracy and for every bureaucrat 
we 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 get rid of we're going to take half their salary and give it to a teacher and half their salary and give it to a taxpayer and um i know the teachers unions would not like that but i think a lot of voters would really like that right you know because like a lot of voters it's a, it's a classic thing where most parents say their their own schools is pretty good or their own kids teachers are pretty good so it's other barbarian kids with those horrible teachers over there anyway so I, but first of all how overstated or understated is this the issue of bureaucratic bloat administrative bloat how much of the money like we spent a lot of money on covid stuff for teachers and it feels like very little of it had actually ended up in the classroom it feels like maybe it ended up in a dacha somewhere on the crimean but i don't know so like where where's the money going yeah, so we pencil this out in the book. And uh, when it comes to something like the staffing surge in K-12, there's an economist at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. His name's Ben Scafferty, and he's done great work on this. And if you go back just to like the early 1950s is, I think, where he starts sort of tracking this. And if memory serves me correct, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, so the numbers may be slightly wrong. But basically in that time period, I think the student population in America has roughly doubled. Um, the rate of growth of teachers has grown at twice that rate. And the rate of growth of non-teaching, administrative, and other staff has grown at something like seven times that rate. And now he's chopped and changed because look, so some part of that, you know, desegregation took place, which changed things. Um, Americans with Disabilities Act and all the things that was in there. But even if you look post No Child Left Behind, while not as extreme, it's mm -hmm. still there. Yeah, in fact, Mike, I mean, it, it post, post NCLB, just to make Mike's point, student enrollment is up 5%. In the 21st century, central office administrators are up 89 percent. Yeah. So so it's been this sort of mix of two things. So one has been a push in many places for smaller class sizes. Um, and then another has been just this, this increasing number of administrators. And so smaller class sizes is one of these things that. Again, I think a, a sort of conservative impulse would be helpful if in these education policy rooms where people would think about the sort of second and third order consequences of the decisions that they make, because everyone's who who isn't for smaller class sizes, right? Everyone can intuitively think, hey, I used to be a teacher. If I had 20 students, if I only had 15 students, well, that that must be better. But no one asks, well, wait, where did those other five kids go? And chances are, if you've already hired all of the best teachers that you can, that means you're having to hire more and more teachers lower and lower down the performance spectrum to, to educate those kids. So paradoxically, even though you're in decreasing class sizes, teacher quality, it seems, from what we know from the research, is way more important than class size. So putting kids into smaller classes with worse teachers is bad. But the other part of it too, yeah, is this growing, growing bureaucracy. And part of this, you know, there's a million different causes of this. Some of this comes from more and more federal red tape, which then creates state bureaucrats that have to do that, which then creates district. These whole fiefdoms can start to emerge that, oh, well, we can't cut these positions because we lose our federal grants. Um, there's all sorts of a compliance framework that comes along with it. Some of this has come along with special education, um, not the actual providing special education to young people, but the bureaucracy and the paperwork that's come out from all of that, that, that frustrates both special special educators and the families of children with special needs as well. So it's just been, yeah, this constant kind of one-way ratchet of bureaucratization um, in K-12, sort of mirroring what we see in higher ed. You know, and then, uh, Jonah, specifically on the pandemic funds. So we pumped about $200 billion into K-12 education as for pandemic relief. This money got spent real slowly. There's a lot of issues with vendor agreements and blah, blah, blah. You, you will hear tendentious efforts by the education establishment to explain that this money wasn't actually wasted. I don't know. I, I think those of us who get paid sometimes out of these buckets uh, tend to think of these funds as kind of the Consultant Employment Act. Uh, Ten minutes ago, while we were waiting to go on the air, I got a request from a school district out in the country. They've got to spend uh, you know, a bunch of this federal money by September 30th. Uh, they liked my book. Can I go out and spend a couple days traveling their schools and offering them tips? Multiply that by the 10,000 of us who are doing this kind of stuff. And I think it's easy to make the case that not much of this money actually uh, served a purpose. You know, and there's a real practical dimension to all of this. Um, we've tended to, when given a choice, the right over the last five or 10 years has tended to engage, uh, has tended to choose culture war when there might be other better ways to make the same fight. 
So on a lot of these questions, for instance, about DEI and teacher preparation or school districts, if we mount the fight as culture war, then what happens is it becomes a he said, she said, and the mainstream press is entirely on the other side. On the other hand, when we're talking about administrative bloat, about dollars going into bureaucrats rather than the pockets of teachers, uh, this is an argument where you wind up defunding the DEI crowd, but you're framing the conversation about solving problems that are much more broadly seen, that invite in teachers, that speak to centrists. And so I think one of the things Mike and I talk about in here is the advantage of a principled conservatism, which is less interested in trying to generate clicks than in trying to tackle problems and frame arguments in a more inclusive fashion. So are teachers underpaid? Uh, good teachers are underpaid. Um, crappy teachers are probably overpaid. And part of the problem with the way we talk about solving teacher pay challenges is we're really reluctant to differentiate. So according to the National Education Association, the bigger of the nation, nation's two unions, median teacher pay today is $70,000 a year. Uh, you wouldn't know this. We know people wouldn't know this because when we do our annual EdNEC survey and you ask people, how much do you think teachers make? They think they make a lot less than they do. Um, that said, um, you know, I think good teachers should certainly be earning in the six figures. And one way to think about this is since the early 1970s, we've doubled the number of teachers relative to the number of kids. If we had spent every one of those dollars, every single one of those dollars on teacher pay, but instead of doubling the size of the workforce, we'd maintain the size of the workforce and put those dollars into compensating the professionals, we could be more selective about who we hire, we could be more disciplined about training, and average teacher pay in the U.S. would be north of $140,000 a year. Um, that seems to me kind of good on all counts. And by the way, our average class size would still be dramatically smaller than class sizes in places in, like Japan and South Korea. Yeah, no, that's very appealing to me. I mean, like, you know, the this, was it, the Pareto distribution, right? So like 20% of salesmen do 80% of the sales, like 20% of the population always ends up owning 80% of the land. I mean, it's like, that's how Pareto discovered it in Italy a hundred years ago. But anyway, um, 20% of the teachers, I suspect do more of the important work than 80% of the teachers. And I'm not, but get the problem with bringing up a Pareto distribution kind of thing is whenever I hear people talk about quality teachers over quantity teachers, which I think is an important distinction, they, if and the, again, I don't pay attention to education policy um, as much. I pay on my most intense days. I pay as much attention to education policy as you do on your vacations. So, like, I don't pay a lot of attention to education policy. But um, it feels like whenever you sort of say let's let's prioritize quality teachers, the response isn't just that they don't want to differentiate you get this kind of like, well, that's impossible to measure. Like that can't, like the, that's, the, none of the dials on our dashboard can capture better teachers or something like that. And and I think it's a deliberate sort of gaslighting kind of thing to like, just don't look at this question, you know, like, but like, how do you look at the question? How do you actually, what are the nuts and bolts of measuring why one teacher is better than another teacher, because the answers you always get in retirement, well, it's selection effect. He got the better students. And so you're measuring, a, you're grading a, a an equal teacher by the results of cherry picked students. That's the argument of the charter school stuff all the time. So like, what are the, what are the ways you can hold all that stuff constant and actually measure what a good teacher is? Well, the, the funny thing is I can, I can even do you one better sort of in this example where, where we cite the, the sort of ridiculousness of this refusing to differentiate pay, even before we get to a conversation about quality and how we measure quality. A very simple problem by the way that we compensate teachers, which are these step and lane pay scales, people may be familiar with them. So the more years that you teach, you get more money and the more degrees that you accumulate, you get more money. Um, one of the problems is that they pay teachers regardless of subject matter the same, right? And so I graduated from college with a degree in English. And it turns out at 22 years old, um, if you have a degree in English, a starting teacher's salary, even in a place where teacher salaries aren't great, compared to your other options, it's not bad, right? But 
my friends who graduated with a degree in mathematics or physics or chemistry, just right off the bat can command such a higher salary. So even before we talk about whether I was a good teacher or a bad teacher, they were the basic labor market realities that people with different specialties can attract different amounts of money. And maybe if we don't want to have shortages in STEM teachers or foreign language teachers, we might want to think about paying them more just so that we can get them because they're, they're telling us that they're taking other jobs. The fact that that is verboten, that we can say, oh, does that mean that a math teacher is more important than a phys ed teacher or than an English teacher? It's like, no, I don't necessarily think that they're more important. There's just a certain external reality that they can make more money outside. And so we need to do it. Now, when it comes to actually trying to evaluate teachers, look, this is the white whale of education research. I think Rick probably knows the numbers better than I do, but the Gates Foundation they, they had this big project, the measures of effective teaching. How much, Rick, do you remember how much? I mean, I think the study itself was like 30 or $50 million. And then there was all the incentives to get the district. Do you, do you remember how much they, they spent on that? Yeah, Gate, it was uh, all in Gates plus public money was close to a billion dollars. <laughs> and did he get an answer? Uh, no, well, not Rick. You, you know this, but you tell the story better than I do. So the RAND evaluation, a uh, seven-year study found clear answers, no impact on how well teachers did, no impact on whether you kept teachers. Um, yeah. And, and so I think, so Jonah, I mean, it's, it's a great question, but I think partly it shows how much the, the public bureaucratization of education has crippled our ability to talk thoughtfully about this. It's true that if you want some kind of good bureaucratic machinery to evaluate how good the nation's three and a half million teachers are, uh, we don't have good answers. And like Mike just said, um, when Bill Gates spent a lot of money to try to do this, they didn't come up with great answers. In fact, they were trying to figure out stuff like, hey, can you judge how good a pre-K special education teacher is based on third to fifth grade test scores at that school, which is probably one of the dumbest experiments ever. But, um, but that said, in lots of fields of work, in journalism, in public policy, in, 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 you know, in the law, we make evaluations every year about the work people are doing, even short of objective numbers, because we understand that there are quality distinctions. And part of those quality distinctions are how big a footprint are people having in the work they're doing. Right now, even if you've got a quote unquote great teacher, they're a great teacher for 24 kids. And the other fourth graders in that school uh, get the crappy alternative teachers. Well, one of the things you'd like to do is if you're going to pay this teacher more, you're not paying them more to do the same work. You're promoting them where they're actually going to make more of a difference. They're going to teach math or reading to more kids. They're going to mentor their colleagues. So it's not just an objective measure of are you good? It's also a measure of what are you doing to make sure that the kids we're serving are being better served. Problem is that we've been reluctant to talk about it this way, that there's rules and regs and cultural things that get in the way. So what we wind up talking about is if we give you a $5,000 bonus for moving kids' test scores, do you do better? And turns out, no, that's not actually the way anybody except maybe mid-century encyclopedia salesmen uh, actually get motivated to do their work. And if you think about it, too, if you're the principal of a school, you know, teaching isn't a sort of unidimensional what makes someone a good teacher, bad teacher. Um, we, we could imagine that there are teachers, if you're putting together a school, there may be some teachers that are better at mentoring students and developing relationships with them. And you might have some teachers that have really amazing content knowledge, and you might have some that are better classroom managers. And you'd imagine if you're building a school, you might want a little bit of all of those things. You know, hey, we don't want to, we don't want all subject matter experts that aren't necessarily great at building relationships with kids, but we don't want all relationships with kids with no substance to them. And anytime we've tried to cram this into, well, that's a good teacher, a bad teacher, we just continue to narrow sort of what it means. So ultimately, sort of as Rick said, we're, we're going to have to find ways to, to sort of empower the leaders to make those types of decisions like they do in so many other fields. Look, I, I, I'm, not trying to de de I'm not trying to denigrate school choice stuff but, or charter schools or anything like that. But we know there are good charter schools and there are bad charter schools, right? And whether how bad the bad charter school is in relationship to a bad public school that's out of my wheelhouse you guys can go do a long division graph on that but the 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 simple fact is is that the nice thing about charter schools is that it's very easy to come up with comparatively speaking a business model 
for how you empower the person in charge of a charter school to manage the charter school. It's much more like an entrepreneurial business than public schools. Is it possible to incentivize managers, administrators, principals, whatever we call them, of public schools um, in a way where, and again, we're talking about this as a wild generalization. I don't think these people don't like their kids and don't want to, you know, they want to do, they want to do right in the world. That's why they went into the business. But at, at the level of broad generalization, it's kind of a slave to two masters problem, right? Because there's a, there's a, there's a public sector union political aspect of these things where you don't want to get wrong with the contract. You don't want to have people filing grievances with you and doing what's best for the kids. Is it possible in the existing arrangement for the administrators of public schools to say, this guy is a fantastic teacher. I'm going to give him more kids and more money. And this guy really not good. And he's going to hand out the balls at gym class. Um, or is, where is the, where, how much leeway do on the existing system, do these kinds of people have? And if you're not going to do profound reform to, to teachers union stuff, how much leeway can you possibly give them? So it's a, it's a great question. So the answer is they have more than you'd think. Um, right now in most states, there are waivers, there are provisions, there's memoranda of understanding which gives school principals, superintendents some leeway to do some of this stuff. Depends on the state, depends on the contract and the district. Um, so some of it, and, and you know, you can we, we could point you to specific places where they've tried some of this incrementally. Part of it's honestly um, a culture problem in the part of ed leadership. Uh, these folks have spent their entire careers in K-12 starting as classroom teachers. Uh, they've never been exposed to other ways of managing uh, personnel or compensating folks. They've been trained in doctoral programs and education leadership at teacher colleges uh, where they're not introduced to any of this stuff. So partly, even where it exists uh, in theory, um, there's just not a lot of you know interest or familiarity with how you would do it differently. Now, the second stage of this is it's very straightforward for states to write laws, which would change uh, the job descriptions, which would overhaul this, which would create it. And you could imagine DeSantis or Kim Reynolds or any number of other governors, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, actually putting forward a legislative program which would create room for all school districts or some school districts to do this. It's not been part of the conservative vernacular, but there's no reason that it shouldn't and couldn't be, especially when the lion's share of America's kids are educated in public schools and are still going to be educated in public schools 20, 25 years from now. I want to get on to higher education because that's that's where the clicks are, man. And uh, <laughs> um, but um, it, 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 it's funny. So like, and I think Biden is a great example of this. When on defense, when you criticize public education, K through 12 and all that kind of stuff, the the sort of standard democratic thing is to conjure this traditional 1950s, early 1960s view of the school teacher as the centerpiece of civic life where uh, they are, you know, I don't know, like Laura Ingalls' mom on Little House, right? It was just like, how could you be, how could you beat up on a teacher? They're the best. They're awesome. They, you know, and they're, and um, it's all very gauzy and nostalgic. And, but when on offense, it's a lot of culture war stuff from the left. I agree with you. The right has become sort of drunk on culture war stuff um, of varying degrees of of legitimacy in my mind. Like there are some arguments that I'm totally with the Chris Rufo's of the world. And there are some arguments where I think Chris Rufo is lost his friggin' mind. Right. So like uh, I'm a Chinese menu guy when it comes to some of this culture war stuff. But um, where do you guys come down on what are the legitimate issues in these culture war fights, um, either being pushed by the left or being pushed by the right when it comes to the K through 12 stuff? Well, look, I'll start because it's, it's, it's classic for me that, you know, when we talk about school choice, obviously I work for a group called Ed Choice. We're the legacy foundation of Milton and Rose Friedman. So we're big school choice 
as you might say, Jonah, who's got two thumbs and loves school choice, this guy does. Um, and whenever you see quite vociferous <laughs> opponents to school choice, all you need to do is just hop on social media uh, and within a relatively short period of time, it will be exposed that they went to private school or they send their kids to private school, or there was some connection to that. The hypocrisy on these particular issues is enormous, not to mention the fact of just broader ideas of people executing or or utilizing school choice, even within the public schooling sector, which is that they chose their house um, based on where the good public schools were. So you have people say, oh, I'm committed to public schools. I send my kids to public schools. And it's like, well, but you spent a few extra hundred thousand dollars of this house versus that house to be in the best school district um, for, for your kids to be able to, to make it into that. So, so I think that that sort of culture around that it, things like school choice or others, that they're elitist or they're things that other people do, um, I think just isn't, isn't always fair. People exercise school choice in lots of different ways. And then obviously Rick could probably speak to a great, the, the, the other sets of, of culture war things that are, that are taking place there too. Yeah. Jonah, I'll, I'll just say that I think in the book, um, you, you know, I think we're pretty, unrelenting that we think the right is justified in a lot of these cultural fights, that we feel like these have been brought from the left to the right, um, contrary to what you the, the notion you would get reading mainstream education coverage. Um, one way to, well, I think the easy way to separate kind of the wheat from the chaff here is, are we talking about the right um, pushing dubious agendas, or are we talking about standing by pretty traditional American values. For instance, uh, three or four years, four years ago, the KIPP charter schools, pretty famous charter school network, um, announced that they were uh, ditching their slogan, work hard, be nice, because it was a legacy of white supremacy culture. Um, I think for the right to say, look, <laughs> we believe in hard work. We believe in traditional virtues. And when you were trying to strip these out of schools, uh, when you were announcing that these are problematic legacies, we're, we're absolutely going to join that fight. That strikes me not only as a fight that you're 70-30 on, uh, but that it's the left is bringing culture war and the, white is res- the right is responding. Uh, when it comes to uh, gender and issues in sports and the fact that dozens of states have said that parents do not have a right to know how their child is identified in school, that strikes me, again, as a place, a, a fight being picked against the right. These schools would notify parents that they gave the kid an aspirin, but they're not going to notify the parents when they're introducing them to dubious notions of gender identity um, under, the, uh, under the guise of medical care. That's enormously problematic. You know, when you survey Americans, more in common has done this. Our colleague Dan Cox has done this. When you ask Americans about should schools teach the success sequence? Or should they teach that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were great strides for human liberty? Lion's share of Americans say yes. Lion's share of Democrats say yes. When schools are embracing the notion that 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 America is a slaveocracy, uh, as propagated by Nicole, you know, Nicole Hannah Jones in the 1619 Project. So for us, it, it should be about making sure we're grounding these fights in shared values that are not just something that appeals to the right, but that are consistently endorsed by large swaths of Americans. And we should be unafraid about engaging on those grounds. I was actually listening to the great interview you did with Jamie Kerchick, uh-huh. um, where uh, I think at a recent uh, Remnant episode where he was speaking about some of these books that have been challenged in, in various places. And I think one thing that, that folks on the right do need to do is be clear about drawing distinctions. It seems to me a lot of the polling that we have on these issues when it talks to when we talk to parents about covering controversial subjects matter how old the kids are, right? So parents are much more comfortable with older high school students reading more controversial material, and they're much more skeptical of young children being exposed to them. I think we need to draw distinctions between great works of literature that have literary merit, but also have some racy content to them, to some of these kind of agitprop books that don't seem to carry that that same weight. So when those great works of literature get caught up and people are challenging Shakespeare's plays, or there's a question of whether or not you should be able to teach Beloved or something like that, okay, maybe we've gone too far. Maybe we need to, to be more clear and have better distinctions that are drawn there. Um, but 
as Rick said, these are 70, 30 or 80, 20. Or when you, when you look at some of these books that are being challenged in libraries, it's like 99 to one people saying there's no possible way that there's any educational value for young children to have these. Yeah. So, um, the, the, I'm glad you just sort of jumped in on that because, and I will just caveat this. This is a part of my own working through some of my own issues kind of thing. But, um, first of all, let me stipulate. I agree entirely that all things being equal, generally speaking, the left qua the left is the aggressor in the culture wars. And then when the right reacts, they're said, how dare you try to impose your values on me? Right. And we, the frustrating thing is that when not under attack, the left brags about being the aggressor in the culture war. They're the forces of progress. They're the forces of change, right? They're moving the wheel of history to the sunny uplands and all these kinds of things. They, they're they very proud about their role in, as they should be, about civil rights. And they're very proud about their role in, you know, in, in pushing for gay marriage and all these kinds of things. That's great. But you can't be proud and boast about pushing these things and at the same time claim the resistance to this are the real aggressors, right? I mean, it, it just it doesn't work there as a syllogism and a word problem, right? So I agree with all that. Where I kind of have a bit of a caution about it is when we say these things as a matter of persuasion and getting and rallying forces to your side, when we say the right is right and the left is wrong, the problem is when you say 70, 80% of parents agree, 50, 60, 70% of those parents are going to be on the left. And if you say they're wrong, they're going to get defensive and do this popular front nonsense and 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 take positions that they otherwise wouldn't. And so that's why I think the making the the distinction part is really important. It's like I know a lot of Democrats. I know a lot of left-wingers that are totally down with all sorts of things, you know, uh, trans rights, gay rights, racial history stuff, but they may not want that to be taught to their first graders. Or they may not want to be taught, you know, and they certainly, they, I certainly, I don't think I know any Democrats or liberals who want their kids to be told that working hard is white, supre- is a white supremacist notion, right? And, um, and so figuring out language that gives people an out to say, I understand, you know, like, I'm a very progressive person, but I don't believe in that, I think is kind of important. And it does make me wonder, like, does the mere word conservative in the title of your book mean that it's not going to get through the door at a lot of places where it should? Sermon over. No, no, no. These, these, are, great, these are great questions. Um, I, I, think, I think part of this, the, this point about making distinctions is crucial. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's probably the problem with the, uh, the Chris, Ru- with the Chris Rufo spike the football, make a tap dance out of it routine, is that to the extent that this is going to be narrated as tribal war, then you've got to go to your side. To the extent that we're talking about shared principles and values, then it becomes, okay, at what age do we want students uh, to learn to question whether or not their nation is, you know, fundamentally evil? Um, Is that a good and healthy thing for fourth graders? Um, Especially if we don't believe it to be Anywhere remotely close to true. The, the pro- so this was actually a conversation we had at the time. The problem with not putting conservative in the title is that there are thousands of education books written each year. None of them are targeted to conservatives. So conservatives have learned that none of this is for them, and they tune it all out. Part of the challenge is in order to try to elevate the level of coherence and thoughtfulness among conservatives who are only intermittently engaging in education, uh, is to make sure they actually find this thing as a resource. But the downside is absolutely right, uh, that for all of the folks in the education bubble, um, it's easy for them to tune this out. Um, you know, there's lots of education professors who will cheerfully tell you they don't need to assign Oakshot or Burke uh, or Friedman because their kids can always watch Fox News. <laughs> and so they get all the exposure they need to kind of right-leaning thought. I mean, I mean, I've had this conversation a dozen times in my professional career. Because so, Sean Hannity and Oakshot, those are two names that just go together, man. They just flow one into the other. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, so, so that, 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 that's, that's, that, that, that is an absolutely fair and legitimate point. And, you know, the one thing Mike and I try to do when we write about this is make the distinction between calling out woke kindergarten 
um, which deserves to be called out. But then how do we respond to it? Um, how do we actually um, constructively talk about what books should be shelved in middle school or elementary libraries? Uh, is it book banning for librarians to exercise discretion? Um, no. And But then how do we do this in a way that doesn't alienate folks who are open to these arguments, but don't want to be seen as picking sides um, against their own tribe? Um, yeah, on this tell people, tell versus show problem of do we say we're conservative or not say we're conservative, we have a very similar debate at the dispatch because we are so not party line. We are so not like partisan. We're not Fox News. We're not about the clicks and the making people angry stuff. And we're so determined to be like fact driven and real world and all that kind of reality based and all that kind of stuff. But we also want to be, but part of that means being honest. <laughs> and that means telling people, here's, here's what our priors are, you know, and here's where we come from. And this is how we think about things and let the people, let the readers judge. Anyway, I, I, I get the point. All right. So higher education. Nuke from orbit or land-based conventional weapons, You're, which, which is, makes more sense. I like the aliens reference, man. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, as much as I, as Mike and I, I think, despise uh, kind of elite higher ed, as troubled as I think the higher ed enterprise writ large is, um, I, we, we, we very forcefully here come out against nuking from orbit. Um, we think one, you know, it's just really hard to build the kind of institutional apparatus, uh, the alumni networks, the, the bodies of expertise that exist. And while these things have, uh, in way too many cases, been captured by ideologues and harnessed to toxic ends, uh, the solution is not to burn the village down. Uh, the solution is try to build better and to repair this. So in the book, we talk about the need, uh, for you know, aggressive cartel busting and deregulation in higher ed. We need to go after institutions which can hide behind their endowments and are insulated from healthy pressures um, by a busted student loan system. We talk about the need to get back in the habit of what we used to do in the 19th century, which was build new institutions at a ferocious clip. Uh, we're big fans of the University of Austin and Minerva. Uh, we're supportive of the kinds of civic centers that we're seeing launched at University of Florida modeled off of, or University of Texas at Austin modeled off of what Robbie George or Paul Carisi have built. So we need to build more. We need to deregulate. We need to trust bust. We need to be unapologetic about calling out and challenging these institutions. But I think burning them to the ground and then hoping for the best, it's not where we come out. Yeah, I'm, I'm was largely joking about the nuke from orbit part of it. So, um, but not everybody is though. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, my, my my take on this, I've been really consistent on this for 25 years, which is that um, as a conservative, small C, large C, whatever, people on the right need to recognize that you cannot, just like you can't have new old friends, you cannot have new old institutions. And I don't care how much, you know, how much of a Jesse Waters or Tucker Carlson fanboy some right-wing orthodontist in New Rochelle is, if their kid gets into Harvard, they want them to go to Harvard because it's cool to brag about your kid going to Harvard. So if elite qualified kids are going to be going through this pipeline of elite universities, it's better to figure out a way to train responsible, rightly educated, rightly morally ordered elites than to just say, well, the elites suck, so we don't care what they do. Because these schools produce you know, very influential, successful people for all sorts of good reasons and bad. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in the sheepskin effect on this kind of stuff. So we've got skin in the game because they're going to be running things no matter what one day. We might as well make them into better citizens, which means you have to sort of engage these institutions rather than just let the worst people on the other side, so to speak, have free reign. No, I was going to say, I think there's very much a kind of Chesterton's fence thing happening here because I, I i agree completely and i think you know the land grant university system was an incredibly important innovation in america i mean I, i'm originally from the midwest and if you just sort of drive through the midwest whether you're in lawrence kansas or ames iowa and suddenly these these 
brilliant institutions emerge um, that were central to agricultural improvements, engineering improvements, lots of important things that happened there. But I think that um, one of the things that we have to think about is, okay, so what were the problems that those institutions were designed to solve? You know, a lot of the problems at that place were if you were in Lawrence, Kansas, or if you were in Ames, Iowa, you didn't have access to a, a full slate of books of, of uh, literate and educated people in order to provide a sort of higher education for you. And so those solved a particular problem at a particular time. And the question is, like, are those the same set of problems that we have today? And it turns out some yes and some no. Like some, there's obviously the social aspect of college, which is incredibly important. And there's, I think, lots of sort of civil society benefits of getting kids together, you know, especially young people at universities and having them have shared experiences of, with one another and the friends you make in college that you keep forever. There's lots of things that are important there. But when it comes to the actual sort of delivery of education, it turns out, you know, you don't have to have access to a 9 million volume library anymore. You know, you did not even that long ago. It was super important. So now I think we need to think about, so what are the problems today? Like, what are the problems in higher education that we need to solve? How can we repurpose or rethink the way our existing institutions um, solve those problems or don't solve those problems? But then also, what are new institutions that we need to help create to solve? But I think starting with that, like, why were these things put there in the first place? And is that is that still true? Is a, is a good sort of just principle to start from. The House hearings last December were a powerful force for good. Um, you know, as much grief as Stefanik got uh, on Saturday Night Live and in, in, in the major papers, uh, this is the kind of accountability that is enormously healthy for institutions which pocket billions in public subsidies and funds, pro nominally private institutions. But I think we also need to think much more rigorously about making sure the rules uh, encourage healthy, responsible competition. So for instance, uh, you know, Harvard and UPenn and MIT have a First Amendment right to free association. They should be able to accept whoever they want within the confines of the law. But if they are accepting students on criteria other than academic merit, it's not clear to me why taxpayers have an interest in underwriting that education. So you could imagine, for instance, saying, look, as long as you're transparent and forthright about the academic criteria, and it's up on the web, and folks can search and make sense of it, that's great. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. You have a First Amendment right, but you should no longer be eligible for the student loan program, for Pell Grants. And you should also tell people, right? You should just like be honest about the services you're rendering, right? That's exactly right. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because going back to the creation of the higher ed funding programs in the 1960s, and then the creation of student loan program in the 90s, uh, conservatives have generally been the folks who said, we don't want to kind of overstep Washington's bounds. Let's let these programs run out. Well, let's let these programs run. Well, what's happened is th those programs running has wound up subsidizing a whole lot of self-interested institutions. And part of what's needed now is a heavy dose of Teddy Roosevelt, of kind of a Ronald Reagan approach, a very traditional trust-busting, deregulatory conservative approach, which says, if you're going to pocket billions in public funds or public subsidies, we absolutely are going to start to change the rules of how this game is played. I've pushed back a little bit on the Chesterton's fence point and, and remnant leaders, wrestlers know as, as Mike clearly is one, um, listeners can't see. He's just got a huge foam finger with says remnant number one that he's waving around. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of Re Chesterton's Fence. It's probably one of the concepts I invoke most often, not just in what I write or when I talk on this podcast, but like at the Starbucks. You know, I mean, I just, I'm just, I'm weird. I just sit next to strangers on the bus and start talking about Chesterton's Fence. So I'm a big Chesterton's Fence guy. But when it comes to elite universities, where I agree with your point entirely, which is a very Yuval Levin-esque point, his, his ghost has been hovering around this whole conversation a bit. Uh... When it comes to big state schools, former ag schools, all that kind of stuff, where I generally think they're doing an okay job, not a great job. The administrative bloat stuff is real. There are all sorts of problems, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you go to the University of, you know, Tennessee or something like that, and you're in an honors program, I think you actually probably get as good an education as you do at Harvard or Yale, and maybe better. I'm a huge fan of community college students because they, 
They tend to be paying for their own way and they want jobs, right? So like they're not doing a lot of queer theory, you know, in antebellum, you know, New Orleans, New Orleans classes. They're like, I want to learn how to repair a truck or do accounting or whatever. And I, and those are, those are Horatio Alger kids, but the Harvard's, the Yale's and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think the weird thing, the dismaying thing is not that they've lost sight of their original mission. It's that they are performing their original mission where in the, 16th and 17th century, 18th century, depending on the school, they were founded not to be schools of merit, merit based. They were there to educate an elite class of people to run the country in effect. And it was not based on merit. It was based on ideological and religious affinity and a certain bit about race and all that. And that's exactly what they're doing today. The religion has gone out the window in terms of traditional religion. But the wokeism, I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of with, with, uh, McWhort, John McWhorter on this is that a lot of wokeism does operate like a religion. Social justice operates like a religion. And I, I'm firmly convinced. And at any time when I say it in public, I get pushback, but when I say it in private to people in, in higher ed, I get a lot of nods. I think the main reason why those Asian kids were getting discriminated against in higher ed at those elite schools wasn't because of anti-Asian bigotry or fear of the yellow peril or any of that stuff. It was that these kids come from first or second generation families where like Jews of yore, they want to go to the best school possible to get jobs and they don't speak the social justice stuff. And they go into things like STEM rather than, you know, um, you know, intersectional intersectional studies or whatever like that. and. They haven't learned the shibboleths and, you know, and secret codes of that those kids who went to Harvard Divinity School 400 years ago, they knew those shibboleths. Anyway, so like these schools, they are pretty, they don't say it out loud necessarily, but sometimes they even do. But what they're there for is not to educate kids to be the smartest or most qualified scientists and doctors and lawyers. They're there to sort of create the next ranks of the ruling class and they've just decided they want a different kind of person to be the 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 ruling class but it's this it's it's the pre-meritocracy vision is is the way i look at these things am i wrong am i crazy well i i don't think you are but one of the things that i think we can take heart in is we actually look back at american history and we think about okay i agree with you that that's how these institutions have existed so so what did we do about that and it turns out, you know, what, 150 years ago. Um, so we said, you know, these existing institutions are not serving us the way that we want them to. So that's when on the public side, we saw the Land Grant Act and we started these great new technical public universities across the country. But also on the private side, I mean, look at the, that sort of next tier of universities under the Ivies and all of their rankings and look when all of them were founded right? Stanford, Duke, Carnegie Mellon, you can sort of go on the list. These were the industrialists of the kind of turn of the 20th century who said, yeah, this is th this stuff isn't going to work for us. Our, our, the needs of our society are changing, the needs of our economy are changing, and we need to create these new institutions to, um, to, to meet those times. And so we have these great public universities and we have many of these amazing private universities. It took them time to catch up to the Harvards and the Yales of the world. But, you know, Stanford's pretty good. Duke's pretty good. Um, and so what I think we argue in the book is like, this is a time for that, right? How about what if all these billionaires from the information age, as opposed to the industrial age, say, hey, we want to build the next Stanford. We want to build the next Duke. We want to create these new institutions because the old ones aren't working as well. And sure, you can't build a new 300-year-old institution, but you can build a new institution that 100 years from now could be Stanford. So I think, I think there are lessons that we can kind of take away from that of how folks responded, both in the public and in the private sector, and I think really made our higher education system much, much better. Okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. Last, last question. Cause we're going a little long here. Um, and I have to sort of salute you guys cause, um, like I'm just confessing my priors. I always work from this unfair assumption that 
talk about maybe it's because I listened to to Jeb Bush, who I like a great deal. But like whenever he would talk about education policy, I would. There's a great line from The Tick, the cartoon The Tick, where The Tick is being briefed with this PowerPoint presentation about a mission, and about thirty seconds into it, he goes, "Charts, boring, losing consciousness." Um, and I always expect conversations about education policy to be on the dull side. And I, every time I do this stuff, I, I, I find it really, really interesting. So congratulations. And the book, you know, is, is, is great on it uh, is great in the same way. But so last question, um, the conservative tribe writ large has been talking about abolishing the department of education within 48 hours of the establishment of the department of education. In fact, they were talking about aborting it before it was born, right? So it is, this is, this is, this is as, as, as they say in animal health, there's a long tradition of existence on this argument about getting rid of the Department of Education. And it came up in the primaries. Vivek Ramaswamy did it. And Vivek Ramaswamy, who was designed in a German lab to get me to disagree with anything that comes out of his mouth because I despise the guy so much. Um, uh, nonetheless, I'm sympathetic to it in theory, right? I'm for shrinking, sending power, devolving power back to the states and all that kind of stuff. What are the three best reasons to get rid of it? And what are the three best reasons to keep it? And I, I, if you want to do the three best reasons to keep it as a way of explaining why we're not going to get rid of it anyway, that's fine. But you know what I mean? It's like, where do, what, what's the serious part of the argument and why is it kind of a major distraction? Or is it not a major distraction? Um, <laughs> great question. Look, it's a major distraction. Um, this was created by Carter as a giveaway to the NEA back. At, he promised it on the campaign trail in 76. He gave it to them in 79. Reagan ran in 80, promising to abolish it. Here it is still half a century later. It's not going anywhere. Um, it's not going anywhere. One, because even when, when you survey the public, even Republicans are opposed to, uh, abolishing the department. Um, it just seems like a nice thing. People are like, well, education's good. Why would we want to eliminate something that's for education? Uh, two, reason not to abolish it is abolishing it doesn't actually change anything. Uh, all the programs still exist. In fact, you couldn't get 218 votes in the House to abolish a single major education program, even in a show vote. So if you abolish a department, nothing's changed. All of those programs just get relocated to Department of H a uh, Department of Labor or over to HHS. Third reason not to eliminate it is because it's a distraction. Um, the biggest reason it's a distraction is that most of what the Department of Ed does is loan money out uh, for higher education. That's the lion's share of what it does. It's basically a bank for higher ed. The K-12 stuff, the early childhood stuff, is kind of the tail on the dog. What should we be doing instead? Well, one, we ought to be addressing the ludicrous situation of student lending right now, where Uncle Sam is pumping, as we've all become <laughs> deeply aware, uh, there's a trillion and a half, two trillion dollars held in federal student loan debt that Democrats are working assiduously to transfer from people who borrowed the money to taxpayers who didn't borrow the money. Uh, second is that if we actually want to rethink the rules around lending out these federal funds, around how federal funds prop up and support higher ed or K-12, you actually want a Department of Education where you can get control over this stuff. And third, part of the problem with things like school discipline is that Democrats have weaponized the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Ed. Um, if you abolish the program and these bureaucrats just drift over to the Department of Labor or HHS, it's actually going to be hard uh, to unwind a whole bunch of the guidance they've put in the field rather than making symbolic, rather than symbolic yak. What we actually need our disciplined efforts to make sure that schools are focused on keeping kids safe, that schools actually feel empowered to make reasonable disciplinary decisions, uh, that things like real bias or anti-Semitism uh, are actually investigated and addressed. And all of that would be harder to do if, even if, if you did abolish the department. So look, worth getting rid of? I mean, I'm not, I, I, you know, I mean, I don't think it serves a whole lot of a useful purpose. But abolishing it is neither likely to change anything of uh, import, and it would represent a whole lot of wasted energy on the part of a Republican administration. All right. 
uh, Mike Machine, Rick Hess, thank you so much for doing this. Um, the the book is Getting Education Right: A Conservative Vision for Improving Early Childhood K through 12 and College. And uh, thanks so much for coming on the Remnant. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, man. Okay, so Rick and Mike have left the studio, and um, I think it became kind of obvious towards the end that Mike is a big Remnant listener. Uh, he was really jazzed to be on the Remnant, which I found very flattering. And and Rick is just a is a good dude. Um, as much as you know, you have to make a you have to get out of his way when he's walking down the prison corridor. It was funny we were talking afterwards, and I was just sort of saying how there's a similar dynamic to like, you know, like last week I had, um, Brad Wilcox on to talk about marriage and his book about marriage. And there's this tendency. There are some topics that because people have deep and real personal experience with that causes them to extrapolate from their own personal, which is another word for anecdotal, um, experience with an institution or a phenomenon and make sweeping generalizations about how things work everywhere. And, um, and I was just telling the guys that like, that must be one of the occupational hazards of doing education policy is that everybody went to school pretty much, um, to one extent or another. And most of the people they run into have kids who are in school or out of school, but had gone, they had sent to school. And so they have profound views of, uh, or, or deeply held experiences that they translate into, you know, views about public policy. And then Rick had made the point, he says, it's a particular problem for the, the worlds that w w the oceans we swim in, because pretty much everyone we meet are people for whom school worked. Right. Um, now I think I'm a little bit of an exception <laughs> to that. Uh, I, I think, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, but for, in, in general, like, you know, you live in the think tank world, you live in the politics world, you live, you know, in, in this kind of stuff, in the journalism world, education is a success story for you. And then you're transferring those lessons of what made a successful educational process to your kids. And it can create a bubble effect about understanding the real challenges and complexities of education outside of your zone of experience. Anyway, just a argument for um, a little epistemic humility about some of these issues. And uh, with that, uh, thanks for listening. Um, I plan on being better rested next time I talk to you because I did late night CNN again last night um, and then early morning CNN again this morning. Not as late as the day before, not as early as the day before, but um, I'm kind of still mushy headed. Other than that, I'll see you next time. No, you won't. This is a podcast. <laughs>